Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's briefing. Um, I'll start, as always, with an update on the current position in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,418 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 18 since yesterday. A total of 1,046 patients are in hospital with either confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That represents a total decrease of 27 from yesterday, including an increase of three in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 27 people were last night in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is the same as the figure yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,695 patients who had tested positive and required hospital treatment for the virus have now been able to leave hospital. Unfortunately, in the last 24 hours, one death has been registered of a patient who had been confirmed through a test as having COVID-19, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,363. That figure should be treated with some caution. Although deaths can be registered at weekends, registration numbers are usually relatively low at weekends and they can be especially low on a Sunday. Uh, for example, just to illustrate that point, last week I reported three deaths on Monday, but then reported 18 deaths on Tuesday. Uh, and so that should be taken into account when considering today's figure. And of course, uh, we must always remember that these numbers are not just statistics. They represent irreplaceable individuals whose loss is mourned by many. And as always, I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. I also want to express once again my deep thanks to our health and care workers. You are doing incredible work in exceptionally challenging circumstances and all of us owe you a real debt of gratitude. Now, the statistics I've just uh, read demonstrate the real progress that we have together made against this virus. There are now far fewer people in hospital and in intensive care than at the peak of the outbreak. But these statistics also demonstrate how fragile that progress is. There are still hundreds of people in hospital uh, suffering from this virus. There are still new infections in many health board areas. And of course, it is still the case that every day I have to stand here and confirm further loss of life. The fact is, the virus is being suppressed, but it has not gone away and it is still extremely dangerous. Indeed, a route map out of lockdown expressly recognises that during phase one, which of course we entered on Friday, there is still a high risk that the virus is not yet contained. And we must all understand that and continue to remember it. Now, I know in the last three days, many of you have had long awaited reunions with family, friends and loved ones. And I really hope that you all enjoyed that and, of course, enjoyed the lovely weather too. I also know that the vast majority of people stuck to the rules when having those reunions. And I want to thank you sincerely for that. You stayed outdoors in small groups and you stayed more than two metres away from other households. So again, uh, my thanks to you for that. However, it's also clear that over the weekend, not everybody stuck to the rules. Um, I'm told uh, by the police that on Saturday alone, there were 797 dispersals. And that is people being moved on for not complying with the rules. And to give some context to that, that 797 is five times higher than the figure the previous Saturday. And there were also clearly cases where, despite the guidance we issued, people were driving more than five miles to beauty spots. In some cases, we know that people were staying overnight in tents, caravans or motorhomes. Some of the early statistics we have from Transport Scotland also give us some cause for concern. Overall, transport yesterday was 70% up from the previous Sunday and transport on Saturday was 60% up on the week before. In some places, Loch Lomond and Glencoe, for example, the increase was even more uh, dramatic than that. On Saturday, on the A82 by Loch Lomond, traffic was around three times higher than it was the previous Saturday, and we saw a similar picture around Glencoe. So I'm going to be 
very blunt here. It is very hard to see how all of that can have been caused by local residents or by people travelling a reasonable distance to meet loved ones. So we will be considering all of this as we continue, as uh, we must do, to assess the impact of the phase one changes. Last week, we deliberately allowed some flexibility when we changed the lockdown restrictions. We recommended that people don't travel more than five miles for recreation, but we left room for some discretion so that you can go further to visit family. Uh, we also strongly recommended that when two households meet, there should be no more than eight people in total in a group. But again, we put that into guidance rather than into law because we do trust uh, and continue to trust the majority to keep those groups small and to stay within the rules. But it is worth being clear, in fact, I have a duty to be clear with you, that if there is continued evidence of even a minority not abiding by these guidelines and travelling unnecessarily, if people meet up in larger groups or if they're making journeys which risk spreading the virus, we will have to put these restrictions on group size and travel distance into law. And we won't hesitate to do that if we think that is necessary for the collective safety and well-being of the population. Of course, I, I should make clear that the stipulation that no more than two households meet at any one time is already the law. Uh, and of course, if need be, it will be enforced by the police. I also want to remind you that the two households should keep two metres apart from each other, not share food or utensils and not go inside each other's houses. And the reason I'm stressing all of this, uh, the real danger we still face, um, is not because I, I want to be imposing these restrictions but it is because the progress we've made so far in tackling COVID-19 is simply not guaranteed and it is not irreversible. Cases could increase again. It wouldn't take too much for that to happen uh, rather than continuing to decrease. And if that happens, then that will result in more loss of life. And if all of that happens, restrictions will have to be reimposed rather than being further relaxed. None of us want that to happen. But the only way of avoiding it is for all of us to comply with the rules. The fact is, unless you're an essential worker or work in one of the categories now permitted to be at work, you should still be spending the majority of your time at home. You should still be seeing far fewer people than you might normally do. And those meetings you are able now to have and your life more generally, all of our lives more generally, should still not be feeling normal. And that basic point applies to everyone across the population. I know uh, from my own experience that young people, for example, uh, are firstly hugely frustrated after weeks indoors uh, and desperate to spend more time with friends in the park or at the beach. Uh, and I know that young people may also think that they are less likely to become seriously ill as a result of this virus. Uh, but I want to uh, say very directly to young people, uh, this virus can still be very harmful to you. Even if you yourself are not adversely affected, you can still pass the virus on to other young people, including your friends. And then some of them, of course, may pass it on to others, for example, parents or grandparents who are at uh, a greater risk of becoming seriously ill. Uh, so please think about that uh, wider interest uh, when you're considering your own behaviour in the days and weeks to come. Uh, the fact is, all of us want to be able to lift more restrictions uh, so that we can meet friends and family in much more normal circumstances. Uh, we want to be able to restart NHS services, as the Health Secretary talked about yesterday, and to allow people more generally to get back to work, school or study. But we can only do this if we keep driving down the overall level of COVID infections and if we continue to suppress the spread of the virus. And we will only do that if all of us continue to stick to the rules. Uh, so please, if I conclude, uh, can conclude again by reminding you of what we are asking everybody to do. Only meet people from uh, other households outside uh, because the risk of transmission outside, uh, while not zero, is lower than the risk of transmission indoors. Uh, even outside, stay two metres apart from people from the other household uh, when you do meet. Uh, don't meet uh, more than one other household at any uh, one time. Don't meet more than one a day. And remember, keep to a maximum of eight people in a group. Wash your hands often. Take hand sanitizer with you if you're out and about. Please wear a face covering when you're in shops or public transport or other enclosed spaces where physical distancing might be more difficult. Avoid hard surfaces and clean any that you do touch. 
If you have symptoms, get tested and follow the advice on self-isolation. And above all, uh, more generally, and this applies to each and every one of us, let's remember that each decision we take as an individual will affect the safety and the well-being of all of us. And I know that is difficult. I understand just as much as anybody does the desire to see more people and to travel outside of our local areas. But if we all stick to these rules, we uh, are helping to suppress this virus. But even if just a few of us don't stick to these rules, we're providing a chance for the virus to spread more quickly and to spread to different parts of the country. So we all need to continue to do the right thing and to do right by each other. I know that the vast majority of you are doing that. And again, I want to sincerely thank you for that. But my appeal goes to everybody across the whole population. Let's stick together and let's all do the right thing for the benefit of ourselves and each other. So thank you very much for listening. I'll hand very briefly to the Interim Chief Medical Officer who might want to just underline the health advice and then we will take questions. So it feels, it feels as though we're at a point of inflection just now where there's a really important opportunity to make sure that we are doubling down on all the public health measures that we would normally take to try and reduce the spread of infection. So as well as the physical distancing um, guidance that we've all become very familiar with, again, I just want to emphasise that people should be making sure that they continue to regularly wash their hands, that they are practising good um, respiratory hygiene if they were to develop uh, a cough or a sneeze when they're out and about and that they're immediately making sure that they return home so that they can isolate and that they can contact services if they develop symptoms. Those familiar symptoms that we're all now aware of, ones such as cough, such as fever, or such as a change in or a loss of the sense of smell or taste, uh, should be things that we're now contacting the services for to to get further advice so that people can be tested and begin that process um, that we've all become now familiar with under Test and Protect. And you can find more details on those type of symptoms and how to go about um, undertaking that process by um, visiting the NHS Inform website. Okay, thank you, uh, Gregor. Uh, I'll now go straight to questions. Of course, the Health Secretary joins us as well today uh, and will participate in answering the questions. Uh, the first question today comes from Reva Alderson from BBC. Reval, are you there? Reval, we can't hear you. Are you maybe still on mute? Can't hear you, Reval. Can we maybe um, move on, Reval? I think you have some technical difficulty. I will come back to you later if you can maybe work out what's wrong with the sound. Okay. Um, Gordon Cree from STV. You've talked about it being... Uh vast majority of people following the rules but at the weekend the flouting of the rules whether it be social distancing meeting people from more than one other household it was pretty widespread how concerned are you that the behavior of this weekend will lead to the figures which should be moving in the right direction going the wrong way um, i still think although we we see pictures on social media and in the media generally i still think uh even taking account of that, the, the vast majority of people will have been complying with these rules because the vast majority of people know why it's important and want to do the right thing. But I think you can uh, take it from the fact I've spent most of uh, my time today uh, talking about the importance of sticking to these rules, highlighting some of the figures that showed that some people didn't stick to the rules over the weekend and, and talking about the consequences of that you know, tells you that I do have a concern and have always had a concern that uh, we will, as we start to come out of lockdown, we will see greater behaviour change than we actually want to see. As it happens, I, I don't think even the majority of the minority who, who flout uh, the rules do so because they don't care. Um, often it may just be not fully understanding what the, the guidance is. That's why it's so important that I take every opportunity to tell people what the guidance is and tell you why it matters. But we have to keep all of this under review literally on a, a daily basis. And if we think that some uh, aspects of this that are currently in guidance need to be put into law to, to make it uh, absolutely clear uh, what people can and can't do, we will do that. And, and similarly, if the 
the figures start to go in the wrong direction and I fervently hope that is not the case and we reduce that risk if we all do stick to these uh, rules, then of course we will potentially have to reimpose some of the restrictions that we have just eased. So, you know, my, my point now uh, is as it has always been, this is something that affects all of us and all of us will influence which direction this goes in now. Um, I think when Jason Leach was here on Friday, he made the the point about the distinction between individual action and individual well-being and community well-being. Um, you know, when somebody's got a sore head and they take a painkiller, it's only them that they're impacting. But if somebody breaches these regulations, potentially they are impacting everybody across the population. So we have to stick at this and we have to do it for ourselves, but also for each other. And I would make a an appeal to people across the country uh, to do that and to do it not because I'm asking you to, but to do it because uh, our well-being collectively as a country depends on it. Uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border, and then I'll try to come back to Reval if he's fixed his sound. Uh, thank you. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, First Minister, isn't the problem for you and indeed for the UK government is that once you've begun to ease these restrictions, people begin to think they have a greater freedom. And even if you were to use powers in law to try and make these things illegal, people just might not go along with them because they've done, they would say, a lot by abiding by the restrictions for the time everyone's been in lockdown. Well, yeah, you can have that council of despair, but I, I'm not sure it would take uh, me, the government or the country very far for me to uh, sort of indulge in that council of despair. And actually, the evidence of the past, what, uh, two two months plus now, is, is the opposite of that, where we have had people doing the right thing for the right reasons. And I understand the frustration. I, I absolutely understand the frustration. I share the frustration. Uh, but I know that if we all give in to that frustration and start to behave in ways that is not sensible, then we will undo all of the good work we've done over these past two months and we'll be back to square one. And, and therefore, we'll have to live under these restrictions for a lot longer and possibly under even more severe restrictions than would otherwise be the case. Um, you know, there's always, and I've said all along, there is always a risk when we start to move out of lockdown. I mean, it's self-evident. We can't stay in lockdown forever. So this moment has to come and we have to be prepared to do it slowly, carefully, carefully, cautiously, and that's what we are doing. And um, that's why we're focusing so much on outdoor transmission. But we have to, I have to continue to make you, the public, understand why this is important. I, I take no pleasure in standing here day in, day out, asking you to restrict how you live your lives. No pleasure whatsoever. I take no pleasure in having to live under these restrictions myself. But I know the alternative to that is a potentially deadly virus running out of control again leading to more deaths and leading to all of us living with these restrictions for longer. So I know which I prefer, and I think actually the vast majority of people across the country get that um, and know that it's the right thing to do as well. Revo, can we hear you now? Well, I uh, certainly hope you can. Yes, Prince we Minister. can. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you for bearing with me. Um, you've uh, been very reasonable today, heaping praise on people for following lockdown rules, as you have over the past 10 weeks. Uh, and, and you've appealed to people's better uh, judgment not to uh, break the rules and break the spirit of the rules. So do you actually criticise those uh, who have uh, broken the rules with beach parties, street parties and, and other uh, activities, uh, ignoring the social distancing requirements uh, over the weekend? If people are deliberately flouting these rules, then yes, I am critical of that because you are putting yourself at risk and you're putting uh, people around you at risk and you're putting uh, the, the general collective well-being of the country at risk. So if, if people are just not bothering uh, about the regulations, then um, I will criticise that. The point I'm making um, is that I, I still believe the majority will have complied and probably the majority or a significant proportion of the minority who didn't didn't do that deliberately or because they don't care. Perhaps they, they, we all just need to understand what the restrictions still are. So I'm going to continue to appeal to Peter, people's better uh, judgment because I think it's served as well as a country thus far. And yes, we can put more into law if we have to and we won't hesitate to do that. But ultimately, we are going to get through this um, better if we if we pull together, stand together and do the right thing 
by each other. And it's that that's got us to where we are right now, where for all the caveats and, and uh, uh, reminders about low weekend registration that I uh, talked about earlier on, where I'm announcing today one death registered yesterday, you know, compared to the, the dozens that I would have been announcing uh, in a single day just a, a few weeks ago, it's only because of our collective effort that we've got to that. And literally, um, almost in a heartbeat, if we don't continue to do the right things now, that will be re reversed. And I don't want that to happen. And I don't believe in your heart of hearts, everybody watching this, that anybody wants this to happen. So let's keep together doing the right things. Uh, Fraser Knight from Global. First Minister, we now know that there have been more than a thousand arrests over the weekend by Police Scotland. We've heard reports of litter being strewn across beaches. And in Glencoe, there was even reports of human waste being dumped there. On Friday, you said that you are the proudest you've ever been of this country. Do you stand by that statement? Yes, I do. I, I'm proud of the vast majority of people in the country who've been doing the right thing and continue to do the right thing. But, you know, I don't want the, the behaviour of a minority uh, to uh, sort of obscure that. But equally, I don't want the behaviour of a minority uh, to threaten and jeopardise the progress that we have made. Um, obviously, the police will, will speak for their own figures. I've given you a figure today about the uh, what the police call compliant dispersals, people who have moved on after being asked to do so by the police. I'm, I'm not sure your arrest figure there is, would all be for COVID-related instances, but the police can uh, explain that. But nevertheless, the figure I gave is significantly higher than the equivalent figure for last weekend. Um, so, look, all I can do is... Uh, use the law where I think that is necessary and appropriate and ask the police, as they do very well, to sensitively and proportionately enforce that. Um, but I actually think more effectively I can continue to appeal to people's good judgment and sense of wanting to do the right thing. And I think the majority of people want to do that. But that means being pretty blunt sometimes about the minority who don't. I, I said a couple of weeks ago in relation to all of this, it's, for me, it's not a popularity contest. Suppressing this virus and keeping it suppressed is so important that even if I have to upset some people by being blunt about uh, my criticism of their behaviour, I'm going to do that because the alternative is we let this virus run out of control and that is unthinkable for all of us. Uh, Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, just wondering on the point of enforcement, uh, what discussions uh, you're currently having with Police Scotland about uh, further enforcement and given your frustrations regarding people traveling or going against the, the advice when it comes to the five mile limit we saw in places like Drimmon over the weekend police were stopping and turning cars away that weren't local and that's despite that not being in law so would you expect to see or would you welcome similar types of roadblocks at other beauty spots perhaps this weekend? Well, in answer to your question, you know, we have ongoing discussions with the police about the regulations, the guidance and the police action and enforcing that, although the, the police decisions around enforcement are for them to take. And I think they've done a really good job in being uh, sensitive and proportionate, but doing what has to be done around this. So these discussions will continue uh, and we will consider any action that has the the desired effect, which is making sure that we don't uh, have a change in behaviour that goes beyond what we think is safe. The reason we didn't put five miles in law is that we, we absolutely don't want people travelling out of the local area to, to beauty spots or tourist spots, but we left a bit of flexibility there for people uh, so that they could maybe go and visit family members in a, a private garden, even although they live more than five miles. So we were trying... and. I, I was very keen that we, in this phase one, give people as much, within constraints, as much opportunity to get that bit of quality of life and quality time with loved ones that we haven't had for so long back again. Um, and so to the minority who flout all of this, it's not only the virus running out of control again that you're risking, it's also taking some of that flexibility away from the people who are abiding by all the rules. So let's, just for all of these reasons, all of us need to continue to... Uh, know what the guidance is, know what the law says, and abide by what it is asking us to do. The uh, details of this are on the Scottish Government website. I've uh, I appealed on Thursday, Friday, and, and several uh, interventions on social media over the weekend for, for people to read that guidance. It sets out pretty clearly what the parameters are. 
There's no excuse for people not really knowing that. So please, if you haven't done it already, if you maybe acted at the weekend, not deliberately to flout the rules, but because you hadn't taken time to read it, please now go and read it and then understand what it is that we're asking you to do and not to do. Uh, Hamish Penman from Original FM. Thank you very much, First Minister. Uh, what impacts do you think the reports and pictures of people flouting the rules at the first opportunity will have on healthcare workers that have been working so tirelessly to keep us safe over the past few weeks? Um, I think if I was a healthcare worker, I would feel very anxious at some of these pictures. I would probably know that it's a, a minority and for all the you know, other reasons that I've just set out there, maybe it's not all deliberate, but they will be the ones that deal with that in hospital wards and ICU units if this virus starts to run out of control again. So, you know, for, for yourself, for your loved ones, for your community, for your country, for our health and care workers, just from the basic point of view of doing the right thing right now, please stick to, to the rules. Maybe the health secretary wants to say a word about the impact on health and care workers. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. I want to say a couple of things about this. Um, I, I think some health and care workers will also feel disappointed um, because, you know, we genuinely, the vast majority of us have genuinely every Thursday uh, stood outside and tried to show our appreciation for them. But that's not enough. We need to show our appreciation for what they have done over many, many weeks by continuing to protect the health service. And we do that by following the rules. We also allow the health service to begin to restart. But if the virus goes backwards, then the steps we are taking to restart those bits of the health service that health workers want to restart. We understand some of the uh, non-COVID health harms that have been inevitably and uh, unavoidably created in order to make sure we were ready for this pandemic. Health workers want to restart, do doctors, nurses, right across the health service. They want to begin carefully restarting our health service. That's what I talked about yesterday. But if the virus uh, goes out of control because we collectively let that happen, then that won't be possible either. So th this is um, serious stuff and we need to do in this phase what we have done in the previous period and that is do the right thing for each other as the first minister said but also make sure that we see the gain not just enough in some extra flexibility and freedoms around how we can live our lives but the gain that is possible there in areas of the health service restarting and people who need health care being able to access it again just to remember we're taking a very slow and cautious approach to coming out of this lockdown and I will never make any apology for that because the uh, the, the consequences of coming out of it too fast are, are obvious for everybody so when we announced these changes last week we did it after very careful consideration and the changes we announced are, are the changes the maximum change we thought was safe to make at this stage um, if we thought it was safer to go further, we would have gone further, but we didn't. So if anybody goes beyond this very gradual uh, change that we announced, then we are all starting to behave in a way, or collectively we're starting to behave in a way that is unsafe and putting uh, the risk of the virus uh, increasing again at, at great uh, great possibility. And I don't want people uh, to do that. So uh, I really can appeal strongly enough today to everybody to, to do the right thing. Uh, right, I'm going to go to uh, Tom Eden from PA. Before I do, can I say I owe Tom an apology because uh, I missed him from my list accidentally on Friday. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, ask him, invite him to ask a question and then if he wants to, I'll give him uh, a second bite at the cherry as well today to make up for uh, forgetting him on Friday. Tom. Very kind. Good afternoon, First Minister, and thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, about Shielded, um, people in Shielded group. Uh, the UK government has announced an easing of restrictions for them, uh, which obviously isn't the case uh, for people up here who remain in lockdown. Uh, I assume that this is, to use the well-worn phrase, uh, guided by the science, um, but can you explain what the scientific basis is for such varied policies? Um, well, our policy, remember, hasn't changed, so maybe it's... Uh 
the government that has changed policy that, that might be better asked this question. I'll hand over to the Chief Medical Officer and to the Health Secretary uh, in a moment, but let me say, I and I've said, I said this on Thursday, I've said it repeatedly, that I absolutely understand how difficult this is for uh, the shielded group right now, and we will, over the next couple of weeks, give refreshed guidance, trying to get a better balance for people within the shielded group. But we have to do that in a considered way, thinking through all the risks. People are in the shielded group because uh, the evidence and the knowledge we have of this virus so far, which you know continues to change, but so far says that these are the people who are most at risk of becoming seriously unwell from it. So it's for the protection of those people that we have uh, given the advice we've given right now. And before we change that advice, uh, we want to make sure that we have given proper and full consideration to it. But I'll ask uh, Gregor and Jean to say a bit more about the uh, Gregor, because it's the Chief Medical Officer's advice that um, the Shielded Group was based on, and then maybe Jean can say a bit more about the process of consideration we're going through. Thanks, First Minister. I mean, this is a group of people who has been particularly on my mind because of the uh, the special burden that they've had to endure over the last um, umpteen weeks. And um, we've looked, as we have done all the way along, about how we can change restrictions and how we can change the circumstances that, that people are living just now. And that's always been on a risk basis that we've examined that, looking at the epidemiology in Scotland as, as, as we've done that, looking at the number of um, kind of cases of infection that still exist within our communities. And when we've examined it, in particular for those who are shielding just now, my judgment is, is, is that it's just not the time yet for us to be able to say that we can change the restrictions that they are currently having to endure. And I, I know that that will come as a matter of disappointment for them. But I also recognise that for some of them, they'll feel uneasy about that change as well. They'll, they'll have a sense of unease as they approach that change because they themselves will wonder what degree of risk that they might have in the future once they start to um, take steps outside again and perhaps even at some point begin to meet other people, socially distanced, etc. as well. So we owe it to them to make sure that we do this cautiously and properly and that we give them the information that they need to be able to do that in a safe way. And that's what we are currently examining just now. And as I say, my judgment at this time is that the current situation that we have in Scotland, the epidemiology that we face in Scotland, it isn't ready for us to be able to take that step just yet. Thanks, Angie. Thanks very much. As, as the First Minister said, and uh, as we've said before, this, this is a group of people that um, is uh, front of our minds about what, what is the best possible advice we could offer to you uh, at this point. And it is hard when you see other people, uh, I understand this, being able to go out a bit more. And we're still asking you uh, to follow the restrictions that we've been asking you to follow for very many weeks. But uh, what we are trying to do now is look with the benefit of that clinical advice at the whole group, at whether or not there is clinical justification to offer slightly different advice depending on your condition. Uh, it won't be personalised for every individual. And what, given that we are entering the summer months, what might be the advice that we can offer you that eases any of the restrictions you're currently in, uh, what we think is the risk to you of doing that, what we think you should do to protect against that risk, and how we as government will support you in the decision that you make. We, we need to take our time to be sure that we've got this right, because what we are saying to you really does matter in terms of the, the risk that you face if the virus, uh, if you become infected by that virus. So we, we want to do the right thing, but we want to take time to be sure that we are doing the right thing. And the final thing I'd say is we've not forgotten about you by any means, but you matter a great deal. And we want to take the right amount of time to get our advice to you as right and as appropriate for you and as clear as we possibly can. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tom, do you have a second question today? That's all right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was just to ask about the test and protect scheme. Um, since it's come in, we haven't seen a big increase in the number of tests being carried out by NHS Scotland. So I was just wondering if you knew how many people have come forward for tests through that scheme and is it working as well as you hoped? Um, 
the early indications are the system is, is working. We will publish data hopefully soon on numbers of people being tested, numbers of contacts that have been traced. We, we don't yet have that data robustly in order uh, to publish it today, but we'll be trying to do that in the, the days to come. Um, there is a point here that I think is, is worth bearing in mind. Um, and, and before I say this, don't take this as any complacency about the direction of travel of, of the virus. Uh, the, the numbers coming through Test and Protect are, are dependent on the numbers with symptoms of, of the virus. And if we have, as we believe we have right now, and we'll continue to have if everybody sticks to the rules, uh, declining transmission, uh, then hopefully we will see the numbers coming forward uh, for testing uh, through Test and Protect, uh, not rising, but, but going in the opposite direction. We need to, though, have the capacity and the, the ability to flex that capacity to take account of anything that happens with prevalence and transmission of the virus in the future. But we will hopefully get the initial data uh, from the first uh, days of Test and Protect uh, for you soon. Uh, Sev Carell from The Guardian. Hello, First Minister. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, it's 10 days since the UK government announced that there will be strict quarantine rules for overseas visitors, particularly those flying into the UK, including a £1,000 fines for people that breached it. There'd be random spot checks. What are the Scottish government's plans for fines and surveillance from people flying in from abroad? Uh, we're still, it's a very good question, a very timely question. We're still finalising uh, the regulations that we will lay um, and looking at two related issues. Uh, one is any enforcement mechanism um, around that. And uh, secondly, the level of any financial penalty for people breaching uh, these uh, requirements. Uh, we haven't uh, finally uh, decided that yet. We have a number of issues to take account of. The, the most effective uh, way of enforcing without putting undue burdens on the police, for example, uh, but also ECHR issues because you know this whole system has to be compliant with ECHR and levels of fine and financial penalty have a bearing there. So we will uh, have to lay regulations shortly um, on this and when we do, the decisions that we've arrived at on these issues will be uh, clear and, and known at that stage. Uh, Paul Malik from The Courier. First Minister, we've been asked to trust the Trace and Protect and all the stipulations as we continue into Phase 1 and that our data will be safe if we are asked to give a test. It was reported this morning that coronavirus details were sent by NHS Orkney to a local business by mistake, which included names, addresses and the test results of these people involved. How is the Scottish Government going to make sure breaches like this are not going to happen again? And do you worry this could impact public confidence in a system which has already breached public trust as early as it has? Well, any uh, situation where data is uh, shared beyond uh, what, what should happen is taken very seriously and uh, properly investigated and steps taken to make sure that it doesn't happen again. The Health Secretary may want to say more um, about the NHS Orkney situation. Uh, but, you know, can I stress uh, very, very strongly that issues of security um, privacy and data protection are uh, very uh, taken very seriously within Test and Protect and will continue to be so. Um, and of course, any lessons that are applicable from uh, regrettable uh, situations like the one you cite in NHS Orkney uh, will be uh, transferred into the, the, the decisions around Test and Protect. But I want people to be, and I, I covered this when we set out Test and Protect, uh, Confidentiality, privacy, security, these are all principles absolutely at the heart of uh, the system because without uh, assurance around these things, then we will not be able to build the trust that we must build in this system for it to be effective. Do you want to say more about NHS, Orkney? Just, just a couple of things. Um, my understanding at this point is that it was a human error, um, but we are uh, investigating exactly what happened, identifying where... Uh, if there was anything other than that human error that needs to be addressed, that we address that and we will set that out. Uh, but also uh, ensuring that uh, there is, if you like, a check on how, uh, as human beings, we handle this data to make sure that uh, an error that is made is picked up very quickly and, if necessary, uh, intervened and uh, addressed. So we are investigating this just now with NHS Orkney. As soon as we are clear about the, the detail of exactly what happened and what steps are being taken to ensure as far as possible it doesn't happen again, then we will set that out and be very clear about that. 
Right, Chris Musson from The Sun. Uh, hi, First Minister. Um, Tony Banks from the Balhousie Care Group. You've probably seen his claim today that, that the Scottish Government has adopted a, what he says is a clear policy to deflect from their own mismanagement of the pandemic's impact on care homes by turning the focus on home managers and owners. Secondly, he said that the Crown Office should investigate all deaths, uh, deaths in all settings rather, not just in care homes. So I just wonder how you'd respond to those two points. Well, on the second point, as, as you well know, that would be a matter for the Crown Office and it would be uh, completely constitutionally inappropriate for me to uh, try to direct or influence the Crown Office in, in the decisions that it has made. The Lord Advocate set out to Parliament um, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was now, uh, the decision uh, around uh, have asking for all deaths in care homes to uh, and all uh, deaths of health and care workers to be notified uh, to, to the Crown Office. Any decision to go beyond that would be for uh, law officers in the Crown Office uh, to take. Um, on the first part of your question, I emphatically disagree. Um, in fact, I've been, and anybody who, and the benefit here of people watching these briefings day in and day out, will have heard me say repeatedly that I, I see this as a partnership and a collaborative approach. Um, Within that, we all have to recognise the roles and responsibilities that government has, that local uh, health boards have, that councils have, that health protection teams have, and yes, that care home providers have as well. But I've never tried uh, to point the finger or say that uh, one partner in any of that is in any way responsible uh, exclusively. I, I've always stressed the different roles and responsibility we have and the importance of being uh, of, of working in a very collaborative way uh, for the protection of people in uh, our uh, care homes. Um, I will continue to see it as that. That's why, for example, we've issued guidance uh, to help care home providers with the decisions they've had to take. It's why we put in place the, the top-up arrangements for PPA, PPE, so that if providers were finding it difficult to access it through their own supply chains, uh, they could access it through the central NHS stockpile and in a whole range of different ways we've tried to help and work together with care homes and that is uh, what we will continue to do. Do you want to add anything Gina? Uh, the only other thing I would add is there's been a, in addition to what the First Minister has set out uh, uh, a number of other areas of support from the health service and from local primary care teams and of course as I've said at these briefings many times uh, I speak regularly with uh, Don McCaskill from Scottish Care to understand the concerns that the care sector has and uh, where specific issues have been raised directly, then we have responded very quickly to those. Uh, I think there might be a conflation here between the work that is underway in the current uh, situation in order to deal with this uh, pandemic and to pay particular attention to the care home sector with the wider issue that has been raised and uh, I think is fair in terms of uh, a spotlight on whether or not there, it is acceptable that we continue to uh, see the landscape of social care in exactly the same way after this pandemic as we do, do at the start of the pandemic. That's an entirely legitimate discussion to have. It's a long-term discussion. It's a wider discussion with the Scottish public, uh, but it, it, it flows sensibly from that just as we will have a discussion as we remobilise the health service about are there better ways to deliver care uh, as we come out of this pandemic than some of the traditional ways that we used as we before we entered it. These are entirely acceptable uh, discussions and appropriate discussions to have. Okay, thanks. Alistair Grant from The Herald. Uh, hi there, thanks very much. Um, the UK Chancellor has announced the process of winding down the, uh, the jobs retention scheme. I think the Health Secretary indicated yesterday there hasn't been any assurance from him that he's prepared to modify his support to account for the differences between the four nations. Uh, at the same time, First Minister, you, you've made clear today you're prepared to reimpose lockdown restrictions if uh, coronavirus starts spreading again. Uh, but if there's no promise of employment support in place, surely Scotland's hands are, are tied in this regard. In future months, surely it won't really be possible to return to full lockdown without employment support unless we're prepared to see mass job losses. Well, can I just try to come back to some basics here? I think most people, and again, not a political point, not a constitutional point, it's actually a health point. I think most people would think it unacceptable that, to use your language, because it's not my language, that Scotland's hands were tied when it came to uh, fighting a pandemic and taking whatever action was required uh, to be taken to suppress the virus. And 
you know, we don't know what will happen with the spread of this virus ahead. I've spent a lot of time today outlining again the risks if we try to come out of lockdown too quickly, either uh, by decision or by, you know, behaviour change that goes beyond what I would like to see. Um, but we have to have the ability to respond to any increases in transmission, whether that is nationally or, or locally, um, and that's uh, very important. So these discussions with the Treasury on a whole range of issues are ongoing and will continue to be ongoing, but I suppose my uh, basic view here would be if the Chancellor, um, and it's his decision to make, would not be prepared to be flexible if, because the virus had increased in Scotland or in a part of Scotland to the extent that we wanted to lock down for a period, um, and that's all hypothetical at this stage, but if that happened, if he didn't want to extend the, uh, the financial support to allow that to happen, then the alternative is to transfer the power to the Scottish Government to borrow more so that we can do that ourselves. I'm up for having all of these discussions, but the basic fundamental point here, and I think, I think people across the political spectrum and with no interest in politics whatsoever could understand that we cannot find ourselves being in a position for financial economic reasons where we're unable to take action necessary to suppress a potentially deadly virus. So, you know, we'll continue to have constructive discussions to make sure that we end up in a sensible position on these kinds of matters. Uh, Vivian Aitken from the record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, we heard, and um, Chris Musman touched on it briefly a moment ago, about the Dalhousie, and they're talking about the confusion on um, information given to care homes. Now, I, th I know we've discussed this before, but the WHO says that every person in a care home who shows signs of having COVID-19 should immediately be taken to hospital. And I know you've said in the past that it has to be based on clinical decision. However, um, Fife Health and Social Care Partnership in a letter to all care home managers said to them that it was vital we do not call 999 ambulances inappropriately or send patients into a very busy hospital environment if it is absolutely not clear cut that they will benefit, not only for the comfort and dignity, but also to ensure that these precious hospital beds and resources are preserved for patients who will benefit from them most. The care home managers say to me that how can they possibly be the ones to judge whether a patient is going to benefit from going to hospital or not, why should the, the onus be put on them? And they feel that even now these should be, like these restrictions should be lifted to allow them to make judgments without them being. I think I get the, the gist, uh, Vivian. Um, can I say, I have, I have no idea what you quoted from there with the WHO, but I'm happy to have a look at that uh, later on. Um, and. There are no restrictions in the sense that there is a blanket policy, uh, and nor should there ever be, that says that an older person shouldn't go from a care home to a hospital if that is uh, in their interest. And what you read out there from uh, Fife Health and Care Partnership, again, I've not seen that, so I, I don't know exactly what you're quoting from, but a very you know, clearly heard you talk about uh, or quote uh, words that, you know, where it is not to the benefit uh, of the older person. So clearly what is in the interest of the older person is what has to come first. I'm going to hand over to the chief medical officer because it should not be for me as a politician uh, either to decide whether somebody should be uh, in a hospital or whether it is better for, for them clinically and for reasons of dignity uh, that they stay in a care home, which is their own home, uh, remember, that should be entirely driven by the best interests of the, the individual. So I'll hand over to uh, Gregor, who can uh, answer this in the way he wants, but might also want to say a word or two about how, in general, it sometimes might not be in the best interest of an older person to be admitted to hospital. It's really important that each one of these cases is judged on the individual merits of that particular case. That's the only way that, in fact, you can take an approach to this. Um, if you, if you start to issue any kind of blanket um, kind of uh, guidance, then, then it doesn't work that way. That's why all the way along we've emphasised in the guidance that, that the clinicians should be involved in the decisions about where the best place for care is in relation to anyone whose normal residence is a care home. And those individual assessments take into account an awful lot of things. Now, this isn't new. This is something that clinicians have done for years and years and years, looking to see exactly how we can provide the best care, the most appropriate care for people who usually reside within a care home. 
And sometimes that is in their own environment, their homely environment, the place where they stay with the people who know them and the people that they trust. And it's really important to recognise that what we're not saying here is an absence of care. The care here is very, very good. We're able to provide all the supportive care that we need in the circumstances. But again, I think I have to be quite clear here that sometimes it's inappropriate to take people from that environment where they're very familiar with, to upseat them and to take them to an environment which they're completely unfamiliar with and may actually be dangerous for them, particularly when some of the, the treatments just may not help them in any way. So, as I say, I think the context for this becomes really, really important. Many people who live in a care home and contract COVID-19 will receive only supportive care because that's the type of treatment which is most likely to make a difference for them. When people at that stage of their lives become ill, particularly with respiratory conditions, whether that be in normal times with an atypical pneumonia or whether that be with COVID-19, the unfortunate truth is that generally they don't respond very well to some of the more invasive types of treatments that are available to younger age groups. And there's a whole load of reasons for that. Some of that is about the effects of age on the body. Some of that is about the other medical conditions that they have as well. But the bottom line is, is that an individual assessment needs to be taken on each occasion to make sure that the care that's provided for that individual and their circumstances is appropriate to what their needs are. Uh, Gina Davidson from the Scotsman. Hi, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, just going back to testing, obviously testing protects is just um, kicking off, so we don't really know what the figures are like for that, but we do know that capacity is at 15,000 tests per day. Um, today, Cancer Research uh, UK have come out saying that if you're going to get back to any kind of regular cancer um, treatment in hospitals and so on, um, then there's the amount of testing is going to have to be stepped up at least around those kind of areas by about 3,000 tests per day. Is that something that you're already looking at? And why is it the case that those tests are not already happening? Because obviously we know that, you know, there's about 3,000, 4,000 tests being done per day and not 15,000. Um, I've not yet seen the Cancer Research UK comments. Obviously, we'll look at them and consider them carefully. But as I think the Health Secretary has said previously, uh, our approach to testing continues to be driven by clinical advice. And the questions around routine testing, uh, which is in addition, of course, to symptomatic testing for people who come forward through Test and Protect because they've got symptoms, uh, these are issues that are under uh, consideration. We've already extended our approach in care homes and the issues, uh, the issue within uh, the NHS is something that we continue to, to look at and consider. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Hi. Um, just on you, your warning that you could, in, could put the five mile limit into law and the limit on groups, could you give us a sense of how quickly that could happen? Are you going to wait until the next review date to, have a, to make a decision on that or could it happen more quickly than that? And just on the stay at home message, um, it sort of looks a little bit frayed after this weekend. Isn't there an issue with it that it doesn't really tell people what to do when they're not at home? Wouldn't it be better to switch to something like stay apart? Um, no, I think stay at home continues to be the the right message for now because that's what we're effectively telling people to do for the majority of their time, apart from the exceptions that are now allowed. We will keep that under review and and evolve it as we go through this. Um, I, I don't I don't think there is any real excuse for people not knowing uh, what they're meant to be doing and not doing. Um, you know, the advice is is there, the guidance is there. It is pretty straightforward and and you know doesn't. Uh, take an awful lot uh, of reading. Uh, so if you haven't read it yet, if you still are in doubt or over the weekend, you maybe didn't fully uh, understand the parameters of the, the current policy, then it's there on the Scottish Government website, www.gov.scot, um, and that sets it out pretty clearly for everybody. Uh, on the first part of your question, it doesn't have to wait till the next review date. We will monitor these things, we'll continue to assess it, and if we think that has to be done uh, more quickly, then we will do that, and I will stand here and explain uh, the basis for that decision uh, as and when we take it. I, I don't want to have to do that. I'd rather continue to give people a bit more flexibility, but 
the priority for me um, and the only thing that matters uh, to me day in and day out right now, and I know this is a view shared by people across the country, is that we continue to get on top of this virus and stay on top of this virus. And that is how all of the decisions I take every day right now are, are judged. Does it help us do that or does it hinder us from doing that? So I'll continue to take these decisions with that objective firmly in mind. Uh, Derek Keeley from the PNJ. So Derek, we're not hearing you. Not hearing you. Are you on mute? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, schools in England are reopening to more pupils from today. But so far, more than 20 local authorities have appealed to defy that by telling our teachers it's still too early and those pupils should be remaining at home. How confident are you that we won't see a similar situation with local authorities in Scotland when schools reopen more fully here? And given we've now seen um, some of the route map in terms of schools reopening, parents be subject to any kind of enforcement uh, or sanction if they decide to keep their children at home? That's not our intention. Um, it's, it's not for me to comment on the situation in England. I, I'll uh, sort of limit myself to commenting on the situation in Scotland. I'm not asking uh, children to go back to school today. I'm not asking parents to send their children back to school today because I think it's too early. Um, and I, I'm very, very clear about that. I think it would be in Scotland uh, taking a risk beyond what would be acceptable at this stage. And I, I don't think it would have the confidence of the vast majority of parents either. Um, and, you know, these will always be difficult, sensitive uh, issues, but that's why the way in which we're trying to, to take these decisions and arrive at these judgments is so important. The work the Deputy First Minister convenes through the Education Recovery Group, which draws uh, partners from local authorities, uh, trade unions, education trade unions, uh, teacher organisations, parent organisations, to try to come to a consensus on the way forward is, is the right thing to do. And hopefully that means that by the time we are uh, opening schools generally, albeit for a, a blended at school, at home uh, model of education, uh, we will have the confidence of, of parents. Um, and so while we, over June, will see uh, teachers go back to prepare for the new term, uh, while we will see uh, small numbers of pupils in transition years perhaps have some time in school, and we will open access at hubs for uh, more uh, children of key workers, for example, uh, schools will not generally reopen before the 11th of August. And, and that's not because I don't want to see children back at school as quickly as possible, but I want to make sure we take decisions that are safe uh, and that we are uh, confident are safe, but also decisions that have the confidence of teachers, parents and young people themselves. So we'll continue uh, to proceed that way in Scotland. And uh, as I say, it's for uh, politicians elsewhere in the UK to, to comment on the arrangements they're putting in place there. Uh, Rachel Watson from the Daily Mail. First Minister, you've spoken a bit about um, turning restrictions and rules into law if people keep flouting the rules that are in place. What would it take for Scotland to go back a step in lockdown? Would you wait for figures to show that more people were catching the virus or would you act if you felt uncomfortable? And also, could a continuous flouting of laws or if you were unhappy with behaviour like at the weekend continues, would that delay phase two? Um, look, th these decisions are based on more than me just feeling uncomfortable. So let me assure you of that, uh, first of all. Uh, we set out, not just in the route map, but in the previous two papers that we published over the, the last few weeks, the, the kind of factors we take into account um, in deciding whether to ease restrictions and what would therefore also influence going back the way. I hope we don't have to to go back the way. Uh, but if we started to see an increase in uh, you know, daily infections, if we started to see uh, an increase in the R number, um, and of course there's a, a relationship between these things, and if we started to see an increase again in some of the sup supplementary measures we look at, which is hospital admissions, ICU admissions, and of course uh, deaths of people from the virus, then we would you know, have to consider very carefully putting uh, further or reimposing uh, restrictions and perhaps putting uh, more uh, severe restrictions on. Uh, but I don't want people to think that's inevitable if we all continue to abide by the rules as they are right now, because these have been carefully considered, uh, then there is no reason for us to, to believe that that will happen. But we'll consider these things 
on a, an ongoing basis. The issue about guidance into law, that would be less dependent on the, uh, the data that I've just spoken about and more dependent on the kind of data that I've quoted today of transport numbers and, and police enforcement figures that showed that people were perhaps not complying with the guidance and, and we had to uh, take a tougher uh, stance on that. I don't want to have to do either of these things. I, I desperately, desperately want us to continue making this progress, to get on top of this horrible virus and for all of us gradually to be able to live our lives more normally again. But I can't do that alone. We can't do it alone. The Scottish Government can't do it alone. On this uh, aspect, we are genuinely in this together. We'll only, we've only made this progress by working together and we'll only continue it by working together. And that's why, you know, with everything I've got from my heart, um, please to everybody out there, familiarise yourself with the guidance and stick to the guidance. And if we all do that, then the day when we're going into phase two and phase three and hopefully ultimately phase four, uh, will be quicker than it will otherwise be and we will get there with less loss of life than will otherwise be the case uh, if we don't stick to these rules. Uh, and lastly today, Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Hello, First Minister. Um, in your opening remarks, you made some interesting... Um, you, you, you made out some interesting figures about traffic flows around Loch Lomond and Glencoe. Do, do you have similar figures of traffic flows from south of the border? Has there been an uptick? Um, and, and given that uh, the north of England has been living under the kind of more liberal uh, lockdown regime that we just saw at the weekend for a few weeks now, um, they, they, they've already got um, a, a much higher um, rate of deaths uh, per head and rate of fe infections per head. Um, perhaps because of the, um, the R rate that is more driven by the agenda in London than the North. So are you monitoring these cross-border flows? Are you monitoring the infection just across the border? And are you taking steps to defend Scotland from that higher R rate infecting the North? We monitor closely all of the data that we have access to. I, I don't have, I certainly don't have in front of me right now, uh, figures on uh, traffic flows from England, I, I don't know to what extent uh, there are published figures there, but I, I don't have access to the the figures that I've just given for for Scotland right now. But it, we look, I look closely every day at these all of these trends and all of the data in Scotland. But I, I look just as closely at the the figures that the UK government publishes. Some of the figures they publish in a UK wide uh, form, of course, but the figures for England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, um, and try to learn from as much as that as possible. I think, as we said at previous briefings, we're looking closely at other countries that started to come out of lockdown earlier than we did to see the impact there. And all of that feeds into the, the decisions that we are taking. Uh, the, the final point I would make here really is, is the key point I suppose I've been making all along. I will always err on the side of caution here and, and I will never ever uh, apologise for that because I don't want to be standing up here announcing numbers of people who have died and therefore if we if we move too quickly or without due care and, and caution then we risk all of this starting to go in the wrong direction and I would rather have restrictions in place for you know a few days or a few weeks uh, longer than lift them earlier and have more people dying so that's the judgment I will continue to make but my final point is I, I can stand here and, and tell you what I, I want you to do. I can tell you the reasons I want you to do it. And I've been at pains to do that day in and day out. We can put things in law, which helps us with the enforcement of that. But ultimately, we will succeed or fail here by the strength of our collective action. Um, and so far, we are succeeding. You know, if you, if you go back a few weeks to the numbers that I was standing here every day reading out compared to the numbers now, you know that we are succeeding in driving down this infection but it is still out there. I'll, tell, I'll end with a, a kind of personal anecdote, and I'm not going to share any more detail about this, I should tell you all, uh, than I'm about to share right now. But until this weekend, I didn't know anybody personally within my, my own family or you know, friend or close colleague network, uh, to the best of my knowledge, who had had uh, this virus in, in a, a sort of significant uh, way. That changed this weekend. Now, why am I telling you that? Uh, that is because it's still there. Even with these numbers going down, there are still people being uh, tested positive for this virus. It's still there. It's ready to pounce. It's ready to jump across all these bridges that we offer it. So if we want to stop that, we must, must, must stick to these guidelines. And I am 
I'm saying this as a citizen as much as as First Minister. Please do that just as you have been doing and together we will continue to make this progress. Uh, and with those final comments, uh, we have no more questions, so uh, I think I'm going to stop it there. Uh, I think you know my feelings on this and I think you know what I'm asking you to do. Uh, my thanks to Gregor and Jean today and also Jill, uh, our BSL interpreter for the day. Uh, we'll be back here tomorrow at uh, 12.30 uh, as usual and uh, I will just leave you with a final plea to go and read the guidance, make sure you understand the guidance and please stick to it. It is for the good of all of us. Thank you very much.